existing and maintaining. In former prairie land, prairie reconstruction is a critical conservation action. I imagine all of us on this call recognize that. And the reason, of course, is because most of it is gone. So it's important for us to be able to do good quality plantings for however we decide to, um, uh, whatever diversity we decide to put on the land, we want it to be um, um, effective. So the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative began um, as a group of practitioners, researchers, and decision makers dedicated to figuring out what factors contribute to successful prairie reconstruction. Um, and Amanda McCulpin and Paul Charland are coordinators for the project. Uh, get to know Amanda because she's the person who will be able to provide training and help get you set up on the, on the database. Um, Ben Weber, we'll see those two uh, pieces of information later. Ben Weber is another person who can help you with some of your questions. He's the team lead for the database team. We'll tell you more about that in a bit. And I'm the science coordinator for the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. The, uh, there's an advisory team. Uh, the Prairie Reconstruction Advisory Team is, consists of about 20 members, and it's a, um, it includes a diversity of different organizations. And uh, this is really, the, these are the workhorses. The people in this, this piece of the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative, these are the people who have carried the initiative to the point where we are right now. And um, um, I would say also the general membership is pushing around 200 members right now on the mailing list, and it, the momentum is growing. PRI is dedicated to sharing ideas, and the, um, it's designed to be interactive to, pr to provide opportunities for wrestling with the knotty problems and questions of prairie reconstruction. And some of the vehicles to share include the field days, and then during these, uh, typically we focus on a particular question and brainstorm with peers, or we dedicate a session to learning about some aspect of, of prairie reconstruction. And it's up to the field leaders to decide how that w would be structured. Um, we also use webinars to share ideas like this one. And there's a website which is hosted on the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative website. That's a mouthful, um, but uh, we'll get that um, information to you on a chat box so that you can copy that if you'd like to see where our website is. This may migrate to a different location in the future, so stay tuned. We'll let you know if that's the case. If you are not on our mailing list and you want to be, um, be sure and contact Paul Charland. He's in charge of communications. The crux of our learning centers on our database monitoring and analysis. Um, so if many people who reconstruct prairie on a variety of sites all record the same data, the same information about their plantings in the same way, then we start to accumulate this tremendous archive of data to mine. With a cohesive monitoring strategy and data analysis, we suddenly have powerful tools for sorting through the uncertainties to learn more precisely about the process of prairie reconstruction and how to do it better. The database um, is, is, as I mentioned, our centerpiece. Uh, to be successful in our work in prairie reconstruction, we need to understand the intricacies of the whole process. As practitioners and researchers, we can increase the pace of our learning by pooling information and ideas and tapping into the strength of our collective experience. The database depends on high quality crowdsourced information from a broad geographic area and a variety of reconstruction techniques. So to be clear, we don't judge the way people do prairie reconstruction. We want to know how you do it and we want to know what happens when you do it. Our success depends on capturing data about many methods of getting to the end point, which is a prairie reconstruction. <clears throat> the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative um, advisory team identified a set of variables. We put our heads together and thought hard about which variables are most likely to affect the quality of a prairie reconstruction. And then with that information, we designed a database to record all those crucial pieces of information about the reconstruction process. So the database can be thought of as capturing information about three distinct phases. And the first one happens before you put a planter on the ground. This is the site information. We ask for information about things such as the location and the types of soil present. In addition, we'll ask for up to 10 years of site history if you have it, including whether it was cropped, the type of crop, whether it was grazed or hayed. 
Uh, we also record the herbicide history if, uh, if known. And if there's other things that it was uh, used for in the past, there's places for you to record that as well. The next piece is the planting process. Um, we, in this case, this is the piece that people are probably most um, uh, focused on when they think about what, what, um, what makes a prairie reconstruction turn out the way it does, but it's really one of three pieces. But it is a very important piece. When we talk about the planting process, we talk about what sort of seed do you use. Was it cleaned? Was it bulk harvested from another planting or a remnant? Was it cleaned? Um, was it tested? What type of test was used? When was the seed planted? And how was it planted? What was the timing? Was it winter, spring, summer, fall? Things grow in any of those seasons, but we may have different results. We ask for the exact date if possible because very, uh, conditions, as you know, vary among years and the exact timing can influence results. We do, by the way, have a, the ability to tie into weather data uh, for sites automatically, so we can link that. In addition, there are places to attach supplementary materials such as maps. The third piece is ongoing management, and how we manage a planting through time is just as important as how we plant it in terms of quality at any given time. So it's very important that all ongoing management actions are recorded. Each discrete management action is entered um, individually, including both the timing and the extent of the action. Again, the idea is pinpoint, to pinpoint the timing in as narrow a window as possible. In addition, there is a place to enter the trigger that caused you to take a particular action. You may begin to realize that not only is this crowdsourced data a wealth of information to analyze, but it's an archival location for you to document what you did on the site. How many times have you looked out at one of your prairie plantings and gone, wow, that is awesome. What did I do? And then you don't really have all the details recorded well. Or that one was terrible. What, what did we do? I don't want to do that again. Here you have an archival place where you can go back and refer to what you did on any given site, in addition to contributing valuable data. So we can't understand what we did if we don't monitor. Um, so we want to, we need measures of success for each planting to objectively uh, uh, examine the outcome. And the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative has designed monitoring protocols to assess vege oops, oops, sorry, vegetative response. Monitoring isn't required, so you don't have to do that if you don't feel comfortable with it. You can still participate in the database and eventually we plan to solicit funding to do monitoring and analysis among many sites that have good data in the database. But if you do monitor, it's to your advantage because you'll be able to pull up an automated report that tells you how your planting is doing. It sort of takes the temperature of your prairie reconstruction. Floristic monitoring has, we've developed two types of protocols. One is a meandering walk and one is a nested plot protocol. And these require different amounts of effort and skill and they also answer different questions. I'm not gonna talk about that in detail today but do want you to know that we did test our fluoristic monitoring protocols last summer, and we've been making revisions on that based on our experiences. So that will be done, we think, somewhere around uh, uh, the beginning of the spring season. Um, this monitoring, of course, can be used in any year of the reconstruction process to give you a snapshot and to give you a tool to be able to follow our reconstruction over time. So with a cohesive strategy, we can compare results among sites. Next steps, we're there. We're at the place of enrolling new participants into the database, training cadre, and this will be done um, as cadres to keep the numbers at a manageable uh, group size to be able to train effectively, but there will be repeat cadres. So that is to say there will be a, a, a number of cadres depending on uh, how many people are interested. And then those people will be, come, can become active participants in data entry. So the, the PRI database gives us the ability to preserve, reference, and study data about hundreds of prairie reconstructions, harnessing the power of collective learning. The more data entered, the sooner we get answers. We aggregate data to accelerate learning and we aren't acting in isolation anymore. 
This helps us improve reconstructions and be more efficient when we do our work. This is a field-driven project to meet field-identified needs. So this is, this is about, about you, it's about us, and about what we think is important to know. Some more next steps include implementing the monitoring protocols. We hope there'll be a, a data, a mobile application for data collection. And as we get a sufficient amount of, of data in the database, then we can start to think about um, finding ways to get um, funding for analysis and interpretation. And in summary, we think that collecting these details about reconstructions from a number of practitioners and pairing it with monitoring information will help us figure out which things to keep doing, which things to avoid, um, or not to spend valuable time on. Some things may not matter at all. Um, so that's just a quick overview. I want to mention that there is a couple of videos. One of them is about the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative and what, what our goals and objectives are and, and where we're going. And the other one is about the database itself. So I think you'll find that uh, posted on the chat here in a minute. And right now I'd like to introduce you to Ben Walker, who is our database team lead. And Ben is going to, if all the stars line up, Ben's going to take us through a live demonstration of how the database works. So you'll be able to actually see it. Take it away, Ben. Thanks, Pauline. Everyone see my screen? Yep. I see it, Ben. Great. So, um, you know, first steps, um, so this is a, a, a Microsoft SharePoint site. Um, it's hosted on our Department of Interior's um, DOI Connect, uh, which is basically a platform where we can share information with our partners. Um, and so in order to gain access from the site, um, you must request access through um, either myself or Amanda. Uh, we'll put our emails in the chat box there. Um, so just shoot one of us a note um, and just tell us that you want access to the PRI database. We're, we're just kind of going through some final testing. So we'll take your information down and um, once, once our final testing's finished, we'll give you access and um, I believe we'll shoot you a note saying that you now have access to the uh, Prairie Reconstruction Initiative database. Um, so this is the main site. Um, and uh, up in the, let me see if I could zoom this in a little bit. So uh, up in the top left, um, you'll basically see a link that will take us to our data entry site. And this is our main page. Um, one thing, please do not enter any private land information um, until we have some privacy issues resolved. Um, and this is, just kind of goes back to how we store uh, personal information. Um, it's a Department of the Interior and Fish and Wildlife Service um, issue. So we're, we're kind of working on that. I think we're making some pretty good progress. So Ben, do you mean that people should not enter any data if they're on private land or they should not enter da location data? Um, as of right now, if, if a reconstruction is done on private land, um, please contact us um, and we'll, we'll see if we can, um, or if we're at a point of where we can enter it. Uh, but please don't automatically enter um, any information that was was done on a private land. Um, so, uh, one, one thing, when you contact us about gaining access to the site, um, we're going to ask you about an overall site name. Um, and so, how we have this database set up, it's kind of a three-tiered system um, in which we have an overall site, which could be a refuge, a wetland management district, um, an area wildlife office, and then from there, we kind of break it down to the planting site, which is this planting unit, this planting unit information. Um, you know, this could be an area of multiple seedings, or perhaps a larger management area, or say a complete WPA. And then we further break it down to a unique seed mix area, um, which is going to have that unique seed mix. So that's kind of our, our smallest scale of resolution. Um, so when you contact us, uh, please be sure to include an overall site because the site administrators are the only ones that are going to be able to add that overall site. So once we get you access to the site, add in your overall site to our, our main list, um, you'll be able to start going through and enter your information um, into the database. So I'm, I, this is just going to kind of be a live demo um, showing you some of the fields that we came up with, um, you know, how it kind of jumps from form to form. 
And then uh, at the end, if anyone has any questions about anything, I'd be, be happy to answer those. So once the overall site information is in there, um, we can start entering. I'll just go to this planet, this planting unit information. Um, and so let me just zoom out one there. Um, so I'll just I'll just demo those quick. Um, so I'm at Glacier Ridge National Wildlife Refuge. Um, that's my overall site. It's already been added. Um, my planting unit name. I'm going to add a large management area that we have, which is called Tilden South. Um, while you're going through, we have these little small pop-up. Um, basically, um, anything with a red asterisk cannot be blank. Um, and so if you have questions about certain things, um, any field where we deemed maybe um, perhaps not clear, we added those pop-up um, um, windows. And if you go back to our home area, on the bottom here, we also have a database user guide, which if you click on this link, it downloads the complete user guide, um, which walks you through step by step. So back at the planet unit, or the, the planting unit, Glacier Ridge, it says Tilden South, I'm put myself, the acreage for Tilden South is 20, 603 acres, um, you know, and, and we're we're kind of get we're kind of getting a little bit at the the planning process, um, the implementation, and then of course with the monitoring uh, protocols that we're going to be included in the end, a little bit at the outcome. And so for this um, site, we're looking at ecological restoration. I'm just going to put in here test. And as you're going through, when you submit your information, you're going to get a little pop-up that's going to say this form was submitted successfully. Okay, from there, um, at the top of all of our forms, um, we kind of have um, kind of quick links to the next form. Um, it it kind of goes in a series. So once I have my planting unit information in here, I can hit my seed mix area. So my seed mix area, this is the area where I have my unique seed mix. Um, and basically you can go down. I'm at Glacial Ridge, planting unit. I now have Tilden South, so my seed mix. Um, let's call this Ridge Top A, and it's about 20 acres. Um, from here, we we included on most forms an area where you can attach. Um, it's kind of hard to see um, our hover box here, but basically, anytime there's attachments, um, we usually provide a naming convention just to make it a little easier. Um, just to provide a little bit of a systematic way of how to name um, either maps or shapefiles. Um, you know, we try to get as much information as we can. Um, this kind of comes later when, um, if users or researchers might want to query some of this information, uh, or, or practitioners as well. Uh, say if you're in Minnesota and you want to look at all the um, music prairie plantings, uh, you know, throughout the the state. Um, we're hoping we're going to easily be able to do that. So uh, I'm looking, I have a, a music site. I'm hopefully looking to plant music prairie. Um, so I got some, let's just say I got some loamy sand, a little bit of clay there. Uh, and then just a little bit on the site conditions here. We're, we're kind of looking to get just a little bit of information. So, um, you know, we don't want all the invasive species present, but we're, we're, we're just kind of interested in some of the more dominant ones. Um, so here I got a little bit of spurge, um, got some smooth brome, and let's just round it out with some crown vetch. And as you click through these, um, we basically design this to have an autofill. And so if you want to search by scientific name, you can do that common name, you can do that, or if you know your, your code for that particular species, um, you can always do that. Um, in every area, we've also included an other, so if you wanted to put an other in there, you can basically come down here and write it in. Okay, so after our seed mix area, we're going to go to our seed mix history. Um, this form was designed to try to gain as much information about the site as we possibly can.
again, we have attachments. And then this is kind of a dynamic form where as you're going through, uh, it's going to ask for what year you planted it. Uh, so we planted it, let's say, in 2015. All right. And then we can go through, we can add information. Um, either it was cropped for five years, I knew that, and then maybe um, two years, I, I, I knew a little bit of that. Um, say if your information is fuzzy, uh, you're just trying to gain or, or just put down a little bit of information, you can use these very basic ones. Um, however, if you have a detailed history, say one to ten years of the site, you can click on that. And then basically it opens up um, these new drop-down forms. So if you see, I added the, the planting year of 2015, um, and that's counting our year zero here. Um, so if I wanted to change it to 2013, it's going to change our year zero to 2013. So from there, uh, we can go through and say it was cropped prior. What crop? It was in soybeans. These were herbicide resistant soybeans. Prior to that, let's say it was hate. Um, we had broom out there, number of cuttings, let's just say we had one. Prior to that, it was a pasture. It was in broom, and I had cow calf pear. Number of grazers, I had 50. It, it's one of these, if you have um, an annual occurrence of, a, of kind of the same use, we added these copy previous ones. So if it was the same in 2011 as it was in 2010 and 29, 2009, we can just copy those and basically it'll auto populate. Um, and so if you have detailed site history for all 10 years and it's the same, this is really a quick way to go through. Um, you know, we also included um, herbicide information, just very basic. Um, and so our, our herbicide resistant soybeans, right there using glyphosate. So it gives you a lot of options, um, you know, and this is this site's pretty flexible where we, we try to limit the number of required fields um, to a few on each form to where, you know, you can enter as little or as much information as you have. Um, from there, any other concerns about this site? Um, this, was a, uh, this was a reclaimed munitions testing ground, uh, hopefully not. And then, of course, we always add comment boxes um, where you can type in or, or write in any other information uh, that you may have about this area. We included this data quality rating. It's one of those where um, if you have excellent confidence in your data on the accuracy of it, um, please put the excellent and, you know, we could kind of rate that. And so, you know, if you have a farmer who's telling you that it might have been in beans or it might have been in corn, I'm not really sure, um, you know, you can, you can basically rate your data a little bit there. And one thing um, with SharePoint, one thing with SharePoint, um, what we found is if you're working on something and someone calls you or you may get pulled to a different task, um, I, I believe SharePoint will log you out after five or six minutes. So if that happens, um, you can always hit this save and continue filling form. Um, and basically it'll save whatever progress you have and you can always go back to it. Uh, where I found this is really handy is when you start to enter seed information. If you're running um, multiple different lots, um, you could have quite a few species there. Um, and so if you get halfway through, um, it's really nice to be able to save and then come back to your work at a later time. So uh, after our seed mix history, our next one's going to be seeding. And we also have a plug planting form, um, say if you're putting plugs in. And so, you know, there's options to kind of go to both. I figure I'll do seeding quick now, and then we can jump over to plug planting. Anytime you see blue boxes, basically this will be an opportunity for you to edit information. And so I'll just show you this quick. So basically this would be a unique entry that I entered prior. Um, and then basically if I hit that, it'll pull up the form and allow me to um, edit my information if I uh, perhaps was reviewing my data and, and something came up as an error. So we won't do that right now. Um, but for our unique seating, uh, we're just going to go through again. 
get our information. And then basically we just want to start date and end date of when that seeding started. Um, let's see, we did it last week starting Wednesday. finished on Thursday, or that was Friday. We have an option here to basically mark if this was an inner seeding or not. Um, so if it's one of those where you're trying to perhaps invent or enhance diversity in a planting, um, this will allow you to click that. Um, you know, perhaps this a researcher, a practitioner um, might want to look at inner seedings or something like that in the future. And so this option just basically allows us to um, split the data, allows you to identify um, inner seedings. Um, basically, we added this uh, formally established seed ecotype if you do a lot of reconstructions and you have seed ecotypes already identified, um, you could always label them here. Uh, we tried to get at a little bit of what was the original source of your seed. It was less than 20 miles away, 20 to 60, 60 to 100, greater than 100, or if it was unknown. We had this option if you used any cultivars or horticultural selections, you can click that. and. I'm just going to hop to another form quick here. Um, and so this is our, our, our last testing area, uh, basically the, the, the seeding form. And so we have a draft of it here. And basically, I, it looks like everything's working. We just need to publish it on that form, and we should be ready to go. Um, but this is pretty much what it'll look like as you're going down. You can select grass form. Um, you can either search by common or scientific name. And this has a little bit of the autocomplete feature. So if you start typing in something, um, it'll take it to the kind of that next level. Um, you can put in species weight if it's grams, ounces, or pounds, and then it should have a um, auto calculate feature uh, where basically um, it, it'll calculate one way or the other, um, just so there's uh, a bit of continuity in in the weight itself. Uh, if you did any type of seed testing. Um, you could report those tests here. And then, of course, the seed mix type, this was a single species or if this was bulk collected. We have an option where you could add the lot number um, to highlight which species came from what lot. If you had any comments, this would be a section here where you could write in if this was a cultivar. Um, then, of course, if this was cleaned, not cleaned, partially cleaned, or completely cleaned, um, if it was tested at all, you're able to provide tests and then you could always write in other tests um, that were done on that seed. And so um, once you fill out your, your species list, um, we have a capacity of 50 species on this right now. Um, and so if it's a situation where you're using multiple lots, um, it's a very high diverse mix, um, basically we just recommend that uh, you fill out another um, form for that particular uh, unique seed mix. And so um, you'd fill this one out. When you finished up, you'd submit it. And then you'd go back through, and just use the kind of the same Rich Top A unique seed mix uh, label, and then just go back down and fill in the remaining species there. And then those would all be tied to that same unique mix. As I'm going down, um, we tried to get a little information about the action itself. What planting method did you use? I used a broadcast. Jay Chuchi was my operator. Um, you know, we, we added this field uh, just because we found through different reconstructions having that equipment operator uh, labeled. Um, sometimes they have, you know, some knowledge that was, um, or, or perhaps something happened during the re during that actual action um, that perhaps wasn't recorded or the, um, you know, the, the person coordinating the restoration wasn't aware of. And so we just try to record as much information. Again, this isn't a required field, and so um, if you don't want to put it or you don't have that information, um, you know, it's not a big deal. If you did any seed to soil contact techniques, you could include, or, um, have those there. Um, you can put in your seeding rates. Um, we did pounds per acre, then of course seeds per square foot. And so if you're using um, another unit, um, you know, uh, ounces per acre or something like that. Uh, please just calculate it. So we have a we have a standardized um, um, unit, and then any other exper experimental practices 
use. Um, you can put down snow seeding for there. If this was done by a contractor or if you're able to calculate any costs, you can record that information here. Any soil tests that were done, and of course we have our comments where you could try to record any other information that you may have that might not have been captured on this form, and of course our data quality rating. So uh, from here, just kind of going into the plug planting. This is just a, a separate form, and in some situations folks are putting um, plugs out on the landscape, and it has um, a, a kind of a pretty similar feel to the seeding. And I believe this form has a limit of 10 um, different plug species, and so if it's one of those where you have more plugs, um, you know, please just, just enter uh, multiple versions this form. Again, start date and end date. Uh, we're trying to get that first date plugs are planted, and then the last date plugs are planted, and then same thing. Um, we have our uh, scientific name, common name that you can search for, and of course, number of plugs that were put in. If you have any other species, yep. so once you select one, you're going to get a new drop-down box that will come in. If you have any other species, um, basically you could add those here. Method, hand planting, assist with mechanical planter, our contact person, and then, of course, um, if the plugs were irrigated, irrigation dates, um, and then, um, most importantly, you know, were these greenhouse or were they salvaged from somewhere else? So, again, we're getting at the cost a little bit, soil information, and, of course, we have our data quality. So, um, from there, I'm just going to return home to our main screen, and so that kind of takes you through all of the information about um, the prairie reconstruction um, part of it. Um, and another really, really important feature um, for this site is the ability to collect management actions at the same spatial scale. So um, for our management actions form, I'm going to click another one here. We're going to go to the crane unit. And um, the nice thing about this tiered system so if you have multiple um, unique seed mix areas in your planting unit, let me see if I have another one. Basically, it'll allow you to capture that information. Um, you can just very quickly click on multiple items. So if I had other seed mixes here, they would show up basically in columns and rows. Here. And so if this management action applied to multiple unique seed mix areas, I can click all of those and submit the form once and be done. And it'll automatically apply those actions to that entire area. Um, so it, it, it really, it's kind of flexible where it allows you to pick out those um, small spatial scales or you can apply it to a much larger area. Management contact person. And then, um, most importantly, you know, were management actions taken? Um, uh, actions that were taken are just as important as actions that weren't, weren't taken. And so, in our user guide, you know, we try to get people, even if nothing happened um, in that particular seed planting, we'd still like you to go through here and um, say no actions weren't taken, and it was a it was a rest year. So I'm just going to select yes and show you our different options here. And so it's going to ask you for all the different actions. Uh, that were taken this year. And we're going to go with woody removal and herbicide. And so each time I click one of these, basically we have new drop-down boxes that start. Um, and so if if you're going through and, and say you uh, you mowed twice or something like that, um, we would like those entered as two separate management actions. And so the start date would be that first day mowing occurred, and then the end date would be the last time. Um, or the, the, that end date of that mowing action. Management trigger, uh, we're trying to get just a little bit of information at why um, this action was kind of set off. We'll just say high composition of its basic species and um, low native species cover. And then if you have anything else, you could always add it in these comment boxes. And herbicide, um, how you did it. We, uh, we did cut stump, and then we have a, a long list of herbicide options. Basically, this is a 
more or less a complete list of um, the trade names for most of the herbicides out there. Um, it's it's kind of long, but it's got the um, kind of autocomplete feature on there as well. And so go through, find it. If you don't um, see your list or your, your herbicide on the list, there should be another one. doesn't have it, we'll be sure to add another um, just in case our list isn't comprehensive. You can add your rate. Um, we just did a 10% solution. We did two gallons total. Um, and then the nice thing here is we, we try to get out a little bit, you know, was this herbicide coverage? Was it a complete coverage of the unit, partial coverage, or were we just spot spraying? Of course, we have our attachment area down here where we can start to attach those shape files of where the management actions occurred, um, or just hand-drawn maps, um, just to kind of get at the, the spatial scale uh, which these actions occurred on. Our wood removal, um, you know, we used uh, heavy equipment. And kicked me out. SharePoint just dropped <laughs> off quick. Okay. So hopefully you can see that. Um, this is kind of where we left off. Um, and so we we're talking about Woody Actions. Um, I'm just going to kind of turn that over to fire now. Um, and basically it gives you the, the same options here um, where you can say that, you know, this was a prescribed fire. Uh, this covered partial um, partial layers of the unit or covered the complete unit. Um, and then same thing, the same options as far as grazers. Um, we were able to, to basically just pull those lists over, um, talk about the different grazers that you could have, the number of animals grazing, and of course that coverage of the unit. And um, finally, um, you know, a text box there where we could add any other management actions um, and then talked about earlier, area where you can add those shape files, maps where these areas occurred, and of course our, our data quality rating. Um, so that is, those are all of our forms. Um, I'm just going to kind of come back here. Um, you know, please, please contact Amanda or myself um, to gain access. We're going through this, this last round of testing. It shouldn't take long. And then we're going to start adding folks to the database um, here pretty quick so you can start entering your information. Um, also, the, our, our information's in the chat box there if you just want to copy um, our, our, uh, our emails. So overall, overall, I mean, it's, it's, it's a system where I think we covered most of the fields um, of what actions might occur during a prairie reconstruction. Um, this is a centralized database. Um, it's stored on our, our servers in Denver. Um, so it's one of those where um, I believe we designed it in a way where users can easily be trained in it. You can have multiple folks in an office um, that, that know how to access, know how to extract their information. And so it really kind of creates a little bit of redundancy um, within staffs if there's turnover, retirements, um, et cetera. Um, so as Pauline mentioned, you know, we, we hope to kind of take that next step um, into perhaps a mobile application, um, adding the monitoring protocols. Um, those monitoring protocols are really our, our, our next big step um, where you know, we we'll kind of have that complete process of um, reconstruction information. We'll have our management action um, um, area, and of course we have the outcome um, where we can start to look with our monitoring protocols. So if uh, anyone has any questions about anything, uh, we'd be happy to answer those. You can either, I believe I'll unmute everyone, um, you can either type them in the chat box or mute off. Um, one other thing that, that uh, Pauline mentioned earlier, 
Um, we have a couple videos um, that we put together for PRI. One of them talks specifically about the database. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a very much abbreviated version of this presentation. Um, it it kind of goes through, talks about some of the um, issues initially with prairie reconstruction, talk about you know, our, our vision for the database, um, and I believe it's only about four or five minutes long. And it's great you know, if you want to show project leaders or other folks that, that may not have a good idea of what PRI does or may not have a good idea of what we're trying to get out with this database. And uh, we'll throw the links in the chat box as well. Um, please copy those. Um, they're, they're hosted on, a, on a Vimeo, and anyone can access those. Hey, Ben. It's um, Trina from Litchfield. Hey, Trina. Hey, I got a question. Um, we're planning on um, picking some of our units and doing meandering walk protocol. We also have a couple units, um, I don't know, I'll call them showcase units that um, would be really useful to have history um, those units. As far as like the PRI group and um, what we're putting in the database, do you guys have preference? Do you want us to start putting in our reconstructions? Um, you know, that we're planning on monitoring. I think those have to be in the database. And then work on some of our priority units, or, I mean, what would you start with as far as what you're going to enter into this system? And, you know, for us, I think we're going to try and start at a small scale. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a, you know, kind of a great plan you have there. Um, you know, it, it, I, th I think the database becomes more powerful if you're able to, um, you know, make those connections between the reconstructions and the monitoring. So yeah, if you start to enter those first, and then start to look at some little showcase units and enter those as you have time, I mean, yeah, that that'd be great. And and I want to uh, just um, kind of um, um, elaborate just a little bit on what Ben just said. The um, the uh, Amanda ha is going to take uh, names of people who want to go through the training, who want, who want to get into the database and start doing this. Um, and, and one of the things that we're in, encouraging people to do is to, just what you said, um, uh, Trina, to start small. Ben illustrated something that's kind of interesting in here. You can do retrospective data. So he, he did an example where he was entering 2015 uh, data from a 2015 planting, and you can do that. Um, and I think what we want to do right now just to get people started is pick something easy, pick, you know, two or three that are, that are recent or new and, and uh, to kind of get the, the, a familiarity with the, the database. You can always add more. But uh, it's good to, we think it's good to start with um, something kind of new and um, um, just Start tracking them as you as you go. It's some, sometimes what we've heard, what we've learned is that um, even though we think we have really good data about past plantings, that, that there's some kind of blanks in our information because we didn't always record every detail the way we would have liked to have. Now that said, if you have information even about a current one and you don't have every piece of information, that's that's okay too. But the, the more you can put in, the better. And uh, a question comes to the chat box, um, basically just, just looking at, um, you know, kind of different um, private lands, you know, exactly what information could we, could we not enter. Um, and for the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, you know, right now, um, you know, private land that has easements or partner projects on there, um, yeah, those are the type of lands that, that we can't add right now. Um, we're, we're hoping to have this, this kind of figured out here pretty quick. Um, I know Andy Allstead um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service is working on it. Uh, areas that, uh, like Nature Conservancy or something like that, has restored in the past and they're becoming WPAs. Um, you know, any of our the Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, fee title lands um, certainly can be entered, even if they were uh, restored prior to our ownership. Yeah, I've been County Conservation Board lands and DNR, or, you know, any of those kind of sites are, are no problem. Yep. And, and the reason we can, and I think Ben mentioned this, but it's, it's 
some legal privacy issues that we have to make sure we don't get crossways with. It's laws. Any other questions? Okay, if, if anything comes up, um, like I said, you, you, you have our contact information. Please okay. feel free to email one of us. Uh, we, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, we're going to have this live here pretty quick, and uh, we'll be sure to, to add folks um, to the site if they want access to it. Hey, Ben, I have a question, this is JB. Sure. Is there a reporting feature, kind of a summary? Yep, that's that's kind of our next step. Um, you know, our, our, our kind of our version one was to get it fully up and operational. Um, we are looking at automated reports, um, something where, um, you know, a user manager could go in, click on a couple boxes, and, you know, get that species list, get that information, um, perhaps draw a map or two. Um, and so that's definitely going to be on our version two, um, and it's, it's kind of um, you know, our, our next big step with this. And there's two types of reports that we're looking at. One of them is just exactly what Ben <clears throat> described, a report of the data that you put in. So you could take that, print it out, put it in your file, and that would serve as your, as your record for what you did that year on that planting. But the other piece that we're, we will be working on will be um, the monitoring data entry piece and the, uh, the report that comes out when the, the, um, the, this database interacts with our, uh, the monitoring data and gives us a report on that interprets the kind of the status of your planting, how, how based on several metrics, um, how does it measure up? So that will be a second sort of report that you can generate. Um, but like Ben says, this is uh, for a future version. Any other questions? Okay, well we certainly appreciate your attention and, and uh, do, do get in contact. Get in contact with any of us if you'd like, but for the database, um, contact um, Ben or Amanda. Thank you all for for participating in this webinar.